my favorite cities. I wish I was there with you in person, but uh, I'm doing this remote. Some of you may know me, some of you may not. I write a blog every day at thefinancer.com about technology and finance and the future. And that's where I focus, which is, where are we going? During the pandemic, um, I've been locked down for two years, pretty much sitting in this room, which is where I am now, it's my study, thinking about things and questioning everything. And I think there's an important perspective to have when you're looking at change and the future and where we are with fintech, because the world we live in is not the world we think we live in. The world we think we live in is a world of countries. Turkey is a country, Europe is a region, Britain is, I don't know what Britain is these days, I live in Poland. Um, there's a war between Russia and Ukraine over land. But to be honest, if you put it in perspective, the world we live in does not have any borders. And the challenge we have today is that the internet does not recognize countries. It does not recognize governments. It does not recognize borders. It does not recognize any of the things that we've grown up with. So the internet is a global community. It's not a national community. And that challenges a lot of fundamentals, particularly around regulations and agreements. Equally, it occurred to me the other day, I saw this quote from Albert Einstein that time does not exist. And I thought, that's really interesting because I live in real time on the internet and transact in real time on the internet, but time does not exist. So what impact does that have on how we think? By way of example, if you go from Afghanistan into China, your clock has to move forward three hours because China has a single time zone. Even though it's a huge country with many, many zones, and most of the world would organize that into three time zones, China says, no, we are a single time zone because they decided that's the way they want to work. You may think this is strange, but you need to think about these things because if borders and countries and companies don't exist and time doesn't exist, then money doesn't exist. We just invented it. And that's where I think it's really interesting right now with cryptocurrencies and central bank digital currencies and the conflict between centralization and decentralization because money is just invented as is time as our borders. And so the world that we've grown up in doesn't exist. And the internet actually reinforces this. It actually makes us rethink everything. And that's what's happening with FinTech and with the world we live in today. We need to think differently. We need to think in a different way. So when I look at past, present and future, I, I look at what's happening and I think about how can we change things and do things different. Specifically, when I look at today and we look at fintech, I think of fintech as the partnership between a parent and a child. You know, finance is wanting to keep everything stable and secure and resilient and reliable like a parent. It wants to keep the status quo, whereas the child wants to kick the walls and paint the ceilings and change everything to create a better world for the future. I find it interesting when I walk into most banks' boardrooms, I meet people like this. But then when I walk into most fintech boardrooms, I meet people like this. It's very different. And we may say fintech is frivolous and stupid and it's going through a hard time, which it is, but fintech's actually changed banking and finance fundamentally since the 2008 crisis. And the reason is that in 2008, cloud computing and mobile technologies matured and allowed a huge number of companies to launch using the bootstrapping of cloud and mobile apps to develop a whole new different world. 
you know, 12,000 startups in 2019 growing to 26,000 in 2021. And 26,000 companies just doing one thing. They're very, very focused doing things with code. In fact, putting it in perspective, in 2010, fintech was only 3% of the valuation of all of financial markets. But by 2021, it's 38%. Gone down a little bit since, but I'll come to that. The specific for me is that every single fintech startup is doing something that's addressing a specific need in a specific a specific area, and they're not trying to be all things to all people. They're doing one thing brilliantly well, and that's where banks actually have their um, weakness. That they're trying to do all things for all people, and they do a lot of things badly. And what I advise fintechs to do is to fix the things that do banks do badly or do things that banks don't do at all, like financial inclusion and financial literacy. And that's the reason why so many fintechs have become unicorns, because they can and because venture capitalists and private equity see massive opportunities in redefining banking based on code based on open banking, based on APIs, based on open systems. And that's the world we live in today. The best example is Stripe. It's my favorite example because Stripe is the highest valued fintech startup out there. It's valued at $95 billion in March 2021. It was launched in 2010 by Patrick and John Collison, these two guys here, these brothers who were 21 and 19 years old at the time. And when you think about that, a teenager launching a company that's now valued 10 years later at $95 billion, it's like Mark Zuckerberg. You know, it's a fantastic oracle. It's amazing. You know, this company, Stripe, is worth more than nine commas banks, which puts it in perspective in just over a decade with seven lines of code seven lines of code i mean i'm sure you know what strike does but if you don't it's merchant checkout online and the companies that use them often leading edge technology companies uh look at their code and say that code is just beautiful and this is something that a lot of us don't realize that when we come to coding these days in finance, then the people who do the code, if they do it well, are rock stars. They're amazing. These guys are rock stars. The code is amazing. It's so simple, so easy, so easy to use. It's plug and play. It makes it just something that anybody can put into an app and get a payment. And the payment is done with seven lines of code. And so they became a company valued at $95 billion after just 10 years. And yet in the last year, they've gone down a lot. They are now $63 billion. And they've lost some people. And in fact, what we're seeing right now is a bit of a fintech bloodbath because a lot of companies, Klarna is a good example, buy now, pay later have lost a lot of valuation. Klarna's lost something like 85% of their value in the last 18 months. And the reason for that is that everybody flooded towards digital when the pandemic occurred. And now, because of uncertainties due to the Russia-Ukraine um, incident and the whole thing going on globally between China, America and other countries, is uncertain. The political economic climate is very uncertain. Um, in the last decade, everything was globalizing. This decade, everything is localizing. And for that reason, fintech has seen a massive drop in funding. And we're going to see a lot of fintech companies go out of business. Um, it's not a problem. Um, it is for those companies going out of business. But for those that are strong, we'll see a lot of acquisitions a lot of companies that come out of this stronger. I put it in context with the boom bust of the internet in 2000. And there was a headline on Time magazine saying Amazon's going bust. Well, Amazon actually is now the biggest company in the world. And Jeff Bezos, one of the 
uh, most wealthy people in the world. Amazon didn't go bust, but some companies did. That's the way the world goes. That's the way the cookie crumbles. We're seeing the same with crypto. We're in a crypto winter. So a fintech bloodbath and a crypto winter means that the space we're in is going through a really tough time. I mean, crypto has gone down 70, 80% in the last year. Um, not good times. And specifically, we've seen a lot of crypto um, encountering rogue players. Um, you know, we, we thought Terra Luna was stable coins tied to each other through an algorithm, and then that suddenly imploded because the algorithm broke. We've seen um, Mt. Gox break down a decade ago, FTX now. And what's interesting for me is now everyone is saying, you know, maybe we should have regulations of the crypto space. Oh, my God, really? You know, the regulation is meant to keep everything stable and secure, and yet it's failed. We've seen a lot of banks going down in the recent weeks and months. Is this a crisis of confidence? Is this a implosion of the industry? I don't think so. But I think we have to ask ourselves some fundamental questions around trust and the things that we believe in, because everything we grew up believing in is now under question. Question everything. When I think about the future, for example, I meet a lot of people in banks' boardrooms that look like this, and yet I wonder if tomorrow's banks' boardrooms I'll meet a lot of people who look like this. The world is changing so quickly, and we have to consider how do we adapt to the world that's changing so quickly. Charles Darwin said that it's not the fastest or the fittest or the most knowledgeable that survive, but the ones that adapt to change. The thing is, he missed out the addendum, which is change to what? What do we need to change into? When I look at future technologies, they're very exciting. But what do they mean to what we're doing? By way of example, Mark Zuckerberg renamed Facebook Meta, but has now dropped investment in the metaverse having lost $24 billion in metaverse investments in the last two years. Part of the reason for that is that I think he was creating something that was not workable. It was like Second Life 2.0. Um, but when you look at Decentraland, for example, that's interesting. And the metaverse needs a metaverse bank. And for me, and I've had this experience through Second Life, you cannot have a virtual metaverse bank unless it's a real bank because it has to have real trust and real backing and real insurance for deposits to make sure we don't lose them. When I look at currencies and digital currencies and the blockchain and everything that's happening in our space around finance, specifically central bank digital currencies, why do we need central bank digital currencies? We've got cryptocurrencies. Well, the reason is that central banks say, well, we're backed by government, we're trusted, we give guarantees, and we're licensed and regulated and trusted and et cetera, et cetera. Well, to be honest, cryptocurrencies are regulated by the network of citizens on the internet. They're trusted by the network of citizens on the internet. They can be transferred and used in real time in the same way as CBDCs, but through the network of citizens on the internet. I've always said you can't have money without government. And people in the Bitcoin community hate when I say that, because they think that I'm talking rubbish. I never said who the government was, though. And you can have money without government, or rather, you can have money with government. You can't have money without government. You have money with government, but the government could be the network of citizens on the internet that doesn't recognize borders or time or countries or companies. And this is our biggest challenge right now. And FinTech is redefining the whole way we think about money. And just to conclude, there's a final piece, which is we can talk about technologies, we can talk about money, 
But the most important thing is the future and our children. And for me, that's encapsulated in the environmental, social and governmental aspects of finance and technology, which I think we fail to recognise too often. And I don't mean climate change, which is actually very important, but you can argue whether it's that important, depending on your belief. My personal belief is I'm very disappointed in humanity when we've destroyed 60% of the diversity of our animals on this planet in the last 50 years. Biodiversity to me is very important. I'm a huge fan of making sure that we look after our fellow creatures on Earth and not just ourselves. And so I end up with this question, which is, so what? What does this all mean? And I've talked about quite a bit of stuff, past, present and future. But the so what for me, I'll come back to and always come back to, which is how do you price an extinction of humanity, an extinction of animals, an extinction of habitat, an extinction of geography, an extinction of Earth? Are we purely here to make money or are we here to actually look after our planet and our fellow creatures on this planet and ourselves? What future do you invest in for your kids? And if there's no future for our kids, what's the point of us being here? I could talk about these things a lot further, but I think I have a few minutes for questions, hopefully. Thank you. Hi again, Cliff. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, presentation. Cliff is here because uh, we have a qu question for Cliff. Hi, Cliff again. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, let me ask you a question before we close this session based on uh, what you have seen in the last 15, 20 years. Please give us a, a few bullet points for entrepreneurs uh, as well as leaders in finance industry towards innovation and change in the coming years. Well, I mean, in the past um, decade, the, the main innovation has been around cloud computing, um, which enabled us to have this ecosystem of APIs and apps. Um, mixed with obviously mobile phone developments. Um, and the biggest thing that's not been developed is the leverage of data, because data is where the crown jewels are. Um, and that's the back office of the financial institutions where the data sits. Um, so adapting to involving and curating a whole range of APIs in the middle office and apps in the front office has been the radical revolution. In the next decade, it's all about, all about the data. And we're seeing that with things like chat GPT, which is uh, artificial intelligence. And we're seeing that with what comes after that, which is more innovation around the usage of data and the leverage of data. I think to a large extent, traditional institutions haven't understood how they need to and can adapt. Um, in that most banks think that digital is a channel that they can give to a project manager called a chief digital officer with a budget and a team. And that's completely wrong because digital has nothing to do with channels or budgets or teams or delegation. It's to do with transformation of the whole company. And if the executive leadership team doesn't get that, then they probably won't be around in 10 years. <laughs> 